My name is Rashawn, uh, Rashawn Reardon, and I'm the founder of Greenleaf Lab. We're an analytical testing laboratory here in Oregon. I'm also a licensed attorney in Oregon, and um, my husband and I also have a cannabis, uh, cannabis uh, law practice. Hi, I'm Christy Novlik. Um, I'm a co-founder and COO at Kiva Confections. We're a California-based um, edible manufacturer. We do distribution as well there in California. Um, we're looking to bring our company into the Oregon market for the next couple months. Hi, my name is Rulina Kirsten. I'm the principal at Haiku Design. I'm focused in the cannabis industry specifically for branding, um, website design. It's a full stack agency, so we do everything. Good morning, my name is Brad Zussman. I am the founder and senior member of Canada Daddy's Wellness Center, Busy Bee Distributing, and Blaze Premier Brands. So I'm going to start um, my presentation, and because I'm an attorney, I kind of felt it would be really important for you to get um, reaffirmation on what the law is at what the law is regarding labeling right now. So my presentation is really on the nuts and bolts of labeling. Um, it's kind of, oftentimes I'll go off and explain different like procedures, but in this sense, I'm really gonna go through and kind of outline each section. Um, and I also wanted this presentation to be available, so if you guys go online, you can read it as well. So really a lot of it is pulled from the rules right now and there's some um, major highlights and focal points that I was hoping you could read about so that you could understand when you're creating your labels. So really I'm gonna again cover the nuts and bolts of labeling. Um, mar uh, marijuana items that are transferred um, or received to dispensaries must meet new labeling requirements. Those labeling requirements originally were gonna be effective as of April 1st but I just went on the website and found out that they pushed it back to June 1st. So now just remember this, the new date is June 1st. If labeling requirements have not been met, the marijuana items must be returned with proper documentation. So really, if you are a producer or processor and you're gonna be providing your own and making your own labels, you really wanna keep up to date on what those requirements are. So when you transfer into a dispensary, they can cross-reference and check and they don't have to return the product to you or, and or create their own labels. So do the new labeling rules apply to everybody? They actually don't apply to everybody. They, um, they are required for all licensed dispensaries currently and they will be required for licensees in the rec recreational market. However, they are not required for growers that transfer to their patients, and it's also not required for um, growers that transfer to a patient's caregiver. So what happens as of June 1st? Um, marijuana items, again, must meet the labeling requirements. This is a two-fold process. This means, again, that as a producer processor, you want to make sure if you're going to have your labeling that it's compliant, but if you're a dispenser, you also want to have a system of checks and balances in place so you can ensure that that producer processor who's transferred in the product has their labeling requirements met. Um, really, in the end, the onus is going to be on the dispensary to really ensure that that's correct. Um, Again, marijuana item may, may not be transferred um, from a dispensary to a patient or to a recreational user until they know that those um, labeling rules are, are up to date. Labels um, must be submitted for pre-approval to the state. Um, if you go onto the website, you can see the access and the information for the state agency, so you can make sure you can have that pre-approval process. Um, what you want to make sure is all your records to the pre-approval process are kept um, and stored just as with any other record keeping requirements. So if at some point you have to prove to, to anyone that you did get the pre-approval, you have that documentation in place. So there's some general label requirements, and the way the rules are written is you're going to see this section that really covers all these general rules, and then it's going to specify each different item. 
what I did is I kind of covered this first portion as the general roles and label requirements so you can get an idea of what all the information is that's going to be really required on these labels. There's a lot of information on there. So you want to make sure that you have um, enough space for, to include all the information. Um, the label must comply with the National Institute of Standards and Technology Handbook, that's NIST. Um, you can do a search and find NIST information online. Um, there is font size regulations, so you can't have a font that's smaller than eight, eight points, and it has to be um, Times New Roman, Helvetica, or Arial. It must be in English, however they do allow you to have that in other languages as well. You need to make sure that the view is unobstructive and conspicuous. And there's also a size requirement of 0.48 um, inches wide by 0.35 inches high. So you really want to, like I said, look at these rules and really start creating your, your design items from it. There are warnings that are required to be on certain products. There is an exception to the warning requirement and that allows you to use a pictogram. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Uh, pictograms are really useful, and I know another speaker will be probably presenting more on that. But um, I find in my business that I love pictograms because they can say so much um, easily in a small amount of space. Um, the labels may not contain untruthful or misleading statements. So that also includes any type of health claims that have not been proven. Um, a lot of those health claims, um, one can make certain claims, but it has to be peer, scientifically peer-reviewed. Okay, and then an item, if you have an item, let's say, that you're making that falls within two categories, for example, if you have a product that you say can be used topically and edibly, and an edible, then what you have to do is make sure that you're complying with both of those subsection of labeling rules and include that on the one label. This is a universal symbol um, up here that's required to be on all the labels as well. Um, the THC and CBD values must be calculated by a laboratory that perform the testing. And then multiple test results must be labeled. So you want to remember this. If you get your product tested by multiple different laboratories, each laboratory that performed that testing needs to be, their information needs to be on the label as well as their test results. And this will be re really interesting to see how it fleshes out because laboratories, some laboratories are going to be licensed and accredited for certain areas of testing compared to others. And then also, if a product potentially goes through, um, has to get retested, you'll, you'll need to place that information on the label as well. So as I spoke of before, item-specific um, labels will be required as well. So there's a section that really breaks down um, the labeling requirements for plants, for seeds, um, usable marijuana, topical, edibles, concentrates and extracts, tinctures, and other cannabinoid products as well. So really go into the, onto the rules and review that. Again, what I do sometimes is I save it in my bookmark and just do a search under Oregon Health Authority or OLCC rules. Right now a lot of these are under the Oregon Health Authority. Um, and, and then you'll find the information specific to your product. Um, so one of the unique things you want to remember is um, for these item specifics, you're going to have a producer or processor's name. You need the common name of the product, uh, the place of the address of where that product was processed. Um, the date of the harvest or the, when the product was made. So that's going to be really different than right now because, you know, the labeling, no one needs to really state when their product was um, made or harvested. Um, activation time, the serving size and serving limits, uh, concentration amounts or weights, and then list of ingredients in descending order for food items. And that also must include allergen warnings. So the key takeaways that I'm hoping that you will get from this is um, plan for label sizes that can include all this important information and complies with the NIST requirements. Um, think about we're creating a label potentially. I've had a couple clients ask us how they envision this and, and I, I recommend it to them. Think about a label where you have your static information that you can reprint over and over. Um, in bulk, and then all the variable information can potentially be a secondary label. 
Um, and I, what I've done too is I went to a food show. There was this really amazing um, food exhibitor show that was in Portland actually last year. And there are all these companies that have um, that are there presenting on different labeling processes and instruments and equipment that you can purchase. So there's you know you can always have someone else make it for you or do it in house. One thing I have noticed um, in this industry in the transition since I've had my business since 2011 now is that um, everything's really changing and, and transforming and you really want to look at professionalizing and I know everyone else here will be talking more to that topic but um, it's really important to be able to have a successful transition for your business. And then always remember the rules are subject to change and so keep yourself updated. I just found out when I was doing the PowerPoint that the rules got pushed back from April 1st to June 1st. And so they're constantly give, putting all the updates on the OHA and OLCC website. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm Christy with Kiva, and um, just to build on what Rashawn was saying, um, it's the the standards of packaging are extremely important. But um, the area that I wanted to highlight today was um, the responsibility of um, edible manufacturers in the um, in the industry. So um, our our products are all about the consumers, um, and I know I'm not alone in that thought. Um, Brad here also has an um, edibles company, and just prior to the panel, we were talking about kind of our dedication to our consumers. Um, and so, uh, as an edible manufacturer, we have a really unique um, opportunity to to address that. Um, we're under the spotlight of our consumers, regulators, the media. Everybody is turning their attention to edibles right now. Um, and we have an amazing opportunity to take our, our industry and the edibles category to a whole new level. Um, Roshan was saying we have this opportunity to professionalize, and that is absolutely the case. Um, edibles are kind of the, they, they don't have the best stigma. Um, as probably most of you know, there's um, a child safety issue, there's the length of time the edibles take to onset, there's the length of time that they last. Um, so there's a few uh, hurdles that we have as an edibles um, sector to overcome. Um, but there, there, luckily, there's, a, there's an upside to that. There's a lot that we can do to, uh, to professionalize. A um, couple of things being... Um, Um, so the, the three main things we can focus on are safety, education, and involvement. Um, safety is, it's up there first because it's most important. It's certainly the most boring of the three elements. Um, safety is, it's not the most uh, exciting thing to talk about when you think about the commercial food world and the way that they implement safety. It's, it's dry, right? It's something that you don't really think of. Um, you know, Frito-Lay, for example, is not uh, promoting the fact that their products are safe, right? That's never something you see on their packaging. You know, E. coli free, or now tested for microbiological contaminants. Because it's just something that is, it's a given, right? Of, of course these companies are testing for microbiological contaminants. I mean, how, how could you sleep at night if you weren't? Um, but it's amazing, in, in California at least, that um, that has been a huge differentiator for our company for the last five years. We're able to say our products are tested and they are free from contaminants and that's why you should consume them and feel good about purchasing them as a dispensary owner. Um, so we, we really need to, as edible companies, step up to the plate and um, have all of our products screened for even the um, microcontaminants that aren't required in some laws. Um, because our laws are all still developing, and so there's a there's an area there where we need to um, kind of be responsible and, and do the right thing, even if it's not required of us. Um, the next thing too is labeling the products. So um, as Roshan was going into, there's a lot that needs to be done on labeling. Um, milligram of THC content is just the very least you can do. Um, as you all know probably, that THC is a psychoactive component in cannabis. And that's really what we need to tell people um, 
that our, that our products are containing. So it should be front and center. Um, it should be very clear to the consumer what they're, what they're consuming. Um, and remember that your, your consumers are incredibly educated, right? So they are, they are hands down your best regulators, right? They will tell you when something seems off. They have, they are going to screen every single product that you put out on the market. So if there's something wrong, I'm sure you'll get phone calls or emails. Um, customers love to tell you their feedback um, and they are, again, just the best regulators for you. Um, I like to use an analogy about um, like a, when, you're, when you're going to a restaurant and, and you don't like the food. Do you ever go back to that restaurant again? There's, there's so many options out there that if, you, if your products aren't delivering what they say that they are on the label, you're going, you're going to lose a consumer for life. Um, and then finally, you need, to, you need to tell them what to do. Um, consumers are starving for information from um, their edible providers, and they're, they're open to hearing what you have to say. So um, for, for our, our products, we provide instructions for use on um, all of our packaging. And we recommend that people start with five milligrams, and this just gives them a starting point. Um, five milligrams is a pretty low dose for most um, consumers, which is exactly why we recommended it, um, so that people aren't overindulging on their first try. Um, even, their, even if they're experienced, it's still a, um, an active reminder as to uh, the, the, the fact that it's so important to go slow and scale up um, as needed. And then uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about your, um, your labeling and what you're going to recommend people start, if it's five milligrams or 10 milligrams or somewhere in between, um, I like to use the mother-in-law analogy. If you wouldn't recommend that amount to your mother-in-law, um, you probably shouldn't recommend it to patients. That's going to be a mistake that you have to live with for the rest of your married life, potentially. So um, that's a kind of a good filter to put that decision through. Um, and then we also have um, a responsibility in the education department. So um, not only do we have to label our products responsibly, but we need to tell people about it and that we've done that and why they need to look, where they need to look on the packaging. Um, and then also just usage in general. So when to eat it, how to eat it, how much to start with, um, you know, where to store the products, out of reach of children, um, all those kinds of reminders and warnings need to be um, on your packaging, but you also need to come out and give this information freely to the people who are going to be um, consuming your products. So transparency is, is, a, is key in that um, communication, and also um, social media campaigns, um, marketing in-store, as much information as you can get out to your uh, consumer base as possible. Speaking opportunities are great. Um, but that's, that's really a key area where consumers are still looking for information from us. Um, and then finally, really to get to the problem at its root is, as an edible company, we, we have the opportunity on a legislative level to reach out to our local governments, um, give them guidance as to how to develop this framework. Um, I'm part of a group in uh, California, a trade association called uh, CCIA, and we've started a manufacturing committee and um, in California, we're, we're in the rulemaking process with our new laws, and so regulators are looking for, um, for direction from us, and they would like to know, you know, what is that recommended dose, and what are the labeling standards, and how should we be conducting our testing, and uh, Roshan's part of the sampling committee, which uh, labs are getting together and, and trying to give guidance on how samples should be taken from products. So there's just a vacuum of information, even on the legislative level. Um, and an example in California right now, we have different cities um, trying to give their own set of rules and regulations. And so what ends up happening is you have different packaging standards in different cities. So you get this patchwork of, um, of laws. So San Francisco wants a manufacture date, but San Jose wants an expiration date. So now each package has to be stamped twice with a date. Um, so it just it creates these um, hurdles and obstacles that we have to overcome as uh, manufacturers. And it, it really doesn't benefit um, our patients very much. So uh, with guidance that we can give to our cities, we should hope to have uh, a better system that's more sustainable, that can be followed um, for all manufacturers. 
So um, to sum things up, as, as edible companies, we've got a awesome opportunity right now to elevate the category and, um, and give, ourselves, uh, give ourselves a boost and uh, boost up our reputation. Um, it's been, the edibles, edibles world has been uh, kind of suppressed and we've got a really awesome chance here to uh, professionalize ourselves and, uh, and really at the end of the day, it's all about the consumers. And if, if the edible companies are, um, are being forthright and acting responsibly, in the end, our consumers win, and so we all win. So, thank you. Thanks, Christy. That was a really, really nice presentation. Um, my name is Raylena Crickson. I'm the principal at Haiku Designs. Like I said, we're a full-stack design agency. Our company works with companies such as Christie and Gretz to develop packaging that is not only compliant, but also aesthetically pleasing. Um, so I'm going to start my talk with a little anecdote from Steve D'Angelo's The Cannabis Manifesto. If you haven't read this, it's a really, really great and concise argument for um, what the new face of cannabis is going to look like in the future. So. Uh, Steve D'Angelo is the founder of Harborside Health Center, which is most recently here in Portland, as well as California. So this is a cannabis-only treatment facility for people with any and all kinds of ailments. So this is a small passage from his book. He says, I'll never forget the day I noticed an older woman in our main dispensing area. Tears were running down her face. When I asked her what was wrong and if I could help, she just held out her hands, saying, nothing is wrong, I'm just very happy. This is the first time I've been able to unclench my fingers in 10 years. A few minutes earlier, she had applied some cannabis-infused lotion from a sample jar next to the bench she was sitting on. I think this perfectly sums up why cannabis branding is so important to be reaching new demographics in our population. If we look here, baby boomers account for the second largest cohort in our population today. Gen X and millennials making up a big portion of that too. Now, baby boomers in particular have lived through various drug propagandas that have warped their idea of cannabis. Anything from reefer madness, to this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> so with this in mind, um, companies' responsibility to use education to end misinformation is extremely important. So <laughs> cannabis branding should legitimize your product and not reinforce negative stereotypes. This means that companies that are taking their branding seriously are going to be the ones to succeed and they're going to be the ones to prosper. Every package is an opportunity to educate the consumer. This means that every part of your package should be clearly labeled, concisely put together, in a way that not only checks all the boxes of compliancy, goes through all of those hurdles, but actually looks good. You know, there's a ton of compliancy regulations, as we saw earlier, um, and my company being based in Denver, we have even more so. So looking at these compliancies as an opportunity to challenge yourself and do better, is how we're going to push forward and create the market for, or create this new cannabis market for ourselves. Oops. So, um, to finish up, I hope that I wasn't too quick in making my point that design is really, really important and should be taken seriously. Um, for those of you that are in the packaging industry or manufacturing industry, um, there needs to be a very, very stringent policy for what kind of persona that you're 
creating for your company, not falling into negative stereotypes, and to really truly create an industry that is, you know, that we're all proud to be in. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Brad. Great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brad Zussman. I am the founder of Canadaddy's Wellness Center, Busy Bee Distributing, and also Blaze Premier Brands, which has the Blaze Bars. We also have our joint line, which is being launched tomorrow. We have our CO2 extraction and our 40B uh, shatter extraction that is coming out. What I like to do to start out here is I need five volunteers who, for, first off, let me ask this. How many people in this room are processors or manufacturers right now? Can I get a show of hands? So quite a few of you. How many of you are dispensary owners in this room? There is actually one. Okay. So can I get five volunteers? Can I get you to come on up here? And what I want to do is grab one of these. A couple of things that I want to point on here is there is a misperception on what it takes to actually bring a product to market and what I want to kind of do is show you guys a little bit about what it takes to physically go out and start something and I did bring it to concept and then actually have a finished product is there one more person so what I'd like to do is guys just go ahead and sit down real quick here and then what I'm going to do real quick here is show you how to assemble one package so I want to kind of, what I want to touch on here is, first off, if you're a processor, the one thing that I would highly recommend you do is to go and consult with a tax attorney as well as an attorney. Make sure that you are positioned uh, correctly for your, your business, uh, because if you don't, you will make some mistakes. I'll give you an idea here. In 2014, I was not structured properly and it cost me $190,000 that I have to pay to the IRS. And this is just basically for producing products that I was not aware of how to structure my company. Also, one of the things that I want to talk about here, so if you guys want to go ahead and pick up your box here, um, this box right here, so the, the joint line, it costs us about $80,000 before we actually put one joint out into the market. And um, so what we do here, this box right here was designed by Lucid Design in town. And um, so what we do is you want to go ahead and push this forward, and then you want to crease it into the middle like this. Then you want to hold it like this. You're going to push down the sides like that, push that in. And then you're going to go ahead and tuck this in like that. And then put it in. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go ahead and insert the joints into the joint container, put the cap on, and then go ahead and close it. And the reason I, I want to show you guys this is because I've made many mistakes as a producer thinking about my cost. What does it actually involve to take a raw product and bring it to a finished product? So just to give you an idea, this box right here uh, I had made out of the United States. It cost me 30 cents for the box. Each one of these containers is 10 cents. So my cost just to put this packaging out is 70 cents plus the labor that it takes to make everything and the cost of the product. So the perception, the problem that we have as processors today is that we are competing with the craft market and they can come in and undercut us, which means where's the value when we're bringing a product like this to market. The future for processing or manufacturing or bringing product to market is going to be a package like this because this is what the consumer needs to know and wants. If you look at the back here, um, yesterday I went to OLCC and I asked them to look at the package. This package right here is 100% compliant to the new state rules except for my uh, license processing number on there. So I, if you guys are more than happy to come up, take a look at the packaging. I have other packaging at my booth that you're welcome to take with you to look at so that you'll know. You'll notice that it has the universal symbol on there. It has the testing lab results. It has everything that you need on there. On the back, you need to have an activation time of how long it takes you to activate your product. If it's a, a product like the concentrate right here, this is, has to be how the future right here 
of how you're going to pack a concentrate here is even though if you put it into a box, it's still going to have to be childproof. So after you have your product put into this, then you're going to have to go ahead and put it into a seal, safety seal it, make the box, put it in, put the label on it. It's very time consuming to do something like this, so just keep this in mind um, when, you're, when you're doing that. Um, I would say that if you are planning on putting, say, $40,000 into a product, double it to eighty dollars to $100,000 because there's nothing in cannabis that is actually the, the true number right there. Um, when you're looking at a supplier, um, if you do not, say, grow your own cannabis or you're looking for outside sourcing, you want to make sure that you have uh, strong capabilities and relationships with these farmers and you want to sign LOIs, letters of intent, to make sure that you have guarantees that you're going to be able to get their flour, their trim to do extraction, whatever it takes for you to be able to get your product. Because um, if you don't do that, you're going to be at the mercy of the farmer. So there are a lot of uh, different farmers and vendors and processors that come in that rely on the outside product when that product dries up, how are you going to continue to keep your brand going? So be aware of that. Um, I would look for post-manufacturing and pre-manufacturing opportunities with your partners. That's really important. Um, and if you're going to bring a product like this to, to the market, make sure that you have lots of marketing dollars and advertising. Because if you're going to bring a brand to market, you can't just expect it to sit on the shelf and not do any kind of cross marketing to go with it. Um, it's really important to advertise like in Dope Magazine, Culture, Organ Leaf, Willamette Weekly. Those are different, uh, the right sources. When you're looking at advertising, make sure you're looking at the distribution point. How many magazines are they printing? It's really important to make sure that you're getting enough impressions to make it worth your time to bring your product to market. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is, as a dispensary owner, I want to talk about what a dispensary owner looks for in bringing a product to market, because this is really important. A lot of farmers miss the concept of what we look for as a, uh, as a retailer. First off, that in, the, in the future here, uh, if you as a farmer are bringing your product into the dispensaries, in retail, you're going to have limited capabilities of bringing it into the dispensaries. As a dispensary owner, I do 15 intakes a day in my dispensary, and it's very overwhelming. I have a staff of 33 people to support all the intaking and processing, labeling, everything that we do in the dispensary, and it is very, very stressful. Um, one of the things that we look for in the dispensary, and this is the hardest thing that I try to talk to farmers, is that if you're going to develop a package, remember that everything at nighttime gets stored in a safe. So if you don't build a POP to protect your product, that your product can go in, the case can close, otherwise what's going to end up happening is that the more time product comes in here, it gets messed up like this. Who's going to want to put a product on here on your shelf that looks like that? Nobody's going to want to. So you've got to keep that in mind, is that how are you going to store the product when it comes in? And that's really important. We have probably lost 50% of the different vendors in our farm and our dispensary due to the fact that they didn't have the proper packaging. And that's super, super important um, to see. Oh yeah, when you're designing a package, one of the things that we look for is three different points to be able to put your package onto the shelf. We look at this as a slot wall so that you can put this on a peg right against your wall. You want to build a design a package that you can put it in a POP that is on top of the counter case itself. You also want to develop a package that can go into the display case itself, but you want to make sure that your package can do all three of them. And the biggest thing that I see is that regarding as a POP uh, on for your products, you're going to have to go in and make an allowance for each dispensary. So when we bring a Blaze product in, we allow up to $100 for a POP to be made personally for that dispensary. 
And the reason is, is that every dispensary has a different design in mind. And you want to make sure that the design that you're creating is going to fit into their model. You want your product to blend into them onto the shelf. You don't want it to be to where it stands out so much that it doesn't fit in their concept. They'll bring the POP in there for a week. After that, it's gone. It's in the back room getting crushed or whatever else. So keep that in mind. Um, when you're bringing a product to market, make sure that you have a return policy in place. That is super important. If you come into my dispensary and you don't have a return policy in place, I'm not going to take your product. Simple as that. Um, you have to be able to willing to back your product up 100%. Um, well, I guess the, one of the last things that we'll talk about is as a manufacturer or processor, you want to make sure that you have a brand ambassador in place to represent your product. Not only do you want to go out and have a sales team to go out and rep your product, you want to be able to find a distributor who can do that for you, but you also want to be able to make sure that you have a brand ambassador in place to go out and make sure that your product is being stored on the shelves correctly, that you're able to go in and talk to the PIRFs, build that relationship, there are so many mistakes that we see that are made in the industry where every manufacturer processor wants to do the whole thing. If you look at all industries, it is virtually impossible for someone, unless you have hundreds of employees, to be fully vertically integrated and handle all your producing, manufacturing, processing, and delivery. So definitely use the vehicles that are out there and concentrate on what you do best as a farmer or a vendor. And that's what I have to say for today. You know, there was um, one topic I know I wanted to talk about too for, as a laboratory for processing and edible makers. One issue that we run into often um, is that some of the processors or edible makers do not have a fully researched, um, they, don't, they have not completed their R&D properly. And so really it's important to contact your laboratory to ensure that you understand what homogeneity is, that your product is homogeneous, and that you have consistency every time you create and make your product. And that's gonna be a really huge issue that I see occurring in the transitional time in Oregon. Oftentimes we have some people who are wanting to get in the business and they're thinking, okay, I can just, you know, cook something up really quick and that's going to be enough. And it's not enough anymore. You have to have a commercial kitchen. You have to have a business plan. You have to have a professional product and you have to be able to prove your homogeneity and make sure that your product is consistent every time. It's just not a commercial kitchen. It has to be an ODA if I'm correct. They're not going to allow you to coexist into a kitchen that is making food for a restaurant or other production. You are going to have to bring your products into a facility that is manufacturing strictly cannabis. So if you do not have the money to bring a product and to build a kitchen, look out there. There are companies that are building kitchens to do manufacturing and that for cannabis related items. Yeah, they're shared use commercial. Right. I know that we're building a pretty big kitchen with a bottling line, chocolate line, lollipop, savory kitchen to be able to private label and manufacture for other companies in town so that they don't have to go out and build the expense of building an ODA kitchen. So um, I think if we're all done with our points, we're going to open this up for a QA and a for you guys to ask us questions and um, get a little bit more information if you have all of those answers. Yeah, um, so you mentioned earlier, what's your name? Christy. Christy. Um, yeah, you had mentioned earlier about testing for uh, additional things that are not required, like the certain like, what type of things should we be looking for to say that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the question was, what are the additional uh, microbiological contaminants that you should be testing for? Um, so in California, uh, our lab, they're called CW Analytical, they're in Oakland. Um, so first they screen our products for kind of the benign um, uh, bacteria, so it's an APC count. 
And then uh, if that comes back higher than a threshold of 100,000 um, plate count, then they'll screen it for the more serious bacteria, so um, E. coli, salmonella, coliform, pseudomonas, mold, and yeast. Um, pseudomonas is one I believe that is an indicator of spoilage. Um, so if you have a product with like a high water content, then you may get something with pseudomonas. Um, e. coli, that's a scary one. Um, salmonella as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's there's an initial screening that happens with APC and APC. Um, being that kind of semi-benign, it's like, you know, the bacteria on, on the tabletop, essentially. Um, not harmful, but like in uh, products like spices and herbs, things that grow outdoors and then are cured, they, uh, they accrue a much higher APC count um, over time. So uh, products like that can have something in the, in the realm of like a million APC plate count. So um, just because they're higher in that um, area, doesn't mean that they're dangerous or that they can't be consumed. They just need to be scanned again one more time to make sure they don't have those other more dangerous um, uh, elements. So. Yeah, just one, one thing to touch on, uh, you guys both touch on it, um, that as a edible producer, my customer is the, uh, is the dispenser for the adult use store, eventually. And the consumer is not my customer. Right? The consumer is my consumer, so know your customer. Yeah, well, the, your, your customer is going to be the dispensary, and from that point, then the consumer will go ahead and take on to the product. Right, but it's, it's an important uh, thing to realize being a producer. Right? Well, not a lot of people really think about it. Yeah, so the question being, um, should you, I, I guess, who should you prioritize when it comes to branding? Is it your customer or the consumer that's going to be buying it? Well, yeah, exactly. Um, but the way things are moving more and more, dispensaries aren't going to be accepting any products that don't look professional and don't look put together. Regardless of how you brand it, um, I mean, if we look back to those co cohorts, you can think of your branding as a type of pseudo-personality that's going to uh, appeal to someone in one of these demographics, hopefully all of them, but it depends on how you're differentiating yourself. Yeah. I'll comment on that too. Yeah, one thing I do is that I don't build my packaging for the dispensary. I build my packaging for the consumer. So what I do is it's really important to go out to the grocery stores, go to Costco, look at the end caps, look at how people are packaging their product. It is very important to be able to package your product in a need to where it's an impulse item. People want to grab it just because it looks good. You know, and that's what it is. And then after that, you just have to make sure that what's inside the product looks as good as the outside of the product. Yeah, and that's that's a really great point. Um, so uh, in California, we're selling definitely to the dispensaries, right? So they are our first, our first hurdle is the dispensary, so the buyer. Um, so it's up to them to take the first uh, leap of faith, right? So they're purchasing your products, putting them on their shelves, but then it is, completely dependent on your pull through. So then you're marketing your products to the consumer. So, um, and the way you do that is very different, right? So dispensaries, they, they like to see warning labels in place because that protects them as a, as a dispenser. Um, they also like to see, you know, they're usually shopping for price point um, or potency, at least in our, in our market. They wanna see um, the highest, highest cannabis content for the lowest price. Yet, um, that's not necessarily the way all consumers shop. So you have to kind of help them rewire their brains to see that they're not just selling, you're, you're not, uh, they're not the only ones buying your product or falling in love with your product, that there is a huge swath of people out there that are gonna be um, leading to the pull through, so. You mentioned your, your consumer, your customer. Right, and I, and I, also, about the I also wanna point on one thing that it is really missed by a lot of processors that come into our dispensary here. You as a processor or a salesman, your job is to come in and sell to the buyer or the PRF. But what's really missed here is that that is one person. I have 25 bud tenders in my store and those are the most important people that you need to go impress because those are your salesmen out there. So if you're going to come into a dispensary, make the sale to the PIRF, but your job is to go out and talk to every one of those bud tenders 
and show them and talk to them about your processes, what makes you who you are, so that if they're better educated, they're going to stand behind your product, and you'll sell 10 times the amount of product in that dispensary. Remember this, it's as much effort as you put in is what you're going to get out of your company. And if you're just going to plan on bringing it to the dispensary, leaving it to the buyer, if you're not educating that buyer, remember, my buyer sees 15 people a day. So you're best off to go from the buyer directly to either the head bud tender, educate them, go in and do sampling, do whatever it takes to get your product out on that shelf. Don't leave it to the dispensary to do it because they see a lot of products and it's just going to go on the back shelf, so keep that in mind.